Okay, well, thank you so much for the, the introduction and um, thank you everyone for attending. So let me just make sure I've got all the computer stuff here working. I think you can see my screen and the video and can you guys hear me? Hopefully. We can. You can all hear? Okay, good. Well, that seems like all the ingredients we need to get started. So I'm really excited to talk to you all about Rancher Continuous Delivery. So. Um, normally I would ask who here has heard of this, but I can't really see if you raise your hand, so that's kind of pointless. But I'll just assume most of you haven't heard about this. So we're going we're gonna to start with a high-level overview of what Rancher Continuous Delivery is. Um, then we're going to talk about why we built this technology that's uh, used in this, in this new feature called Fleet. Um, this is kind of the underlying engine. And then we'll go into some architecture and uh, kind of tease apart the technicals, that's always fun. And then finally, hopefully the most exciting part, we'll do a live demo, which is always risky, but we like to, uh, we like to live on the edge here at Rancher, so hopefully this will, be, this will be fun for us all. All right, so what is Fleet? Well, Fleet is this engine that we have developed. It's an open source project at Rancher, um, and it's designed for the problem of GitOps at scale. Uh, it's suitable for one or one million clusters, um, and that's that's one or one to one million clusters. That doesn't mean one or one million clusters, because obviously there's lots of uh, you know, scales in between that. I would I would assume. So uh, this is a this is a really important thing we think for the future of uh, where Kubernetes is heading. So and let me just take a step back actually and just bring up this other concept, which is um, when we started Rancher. Uh, five years ago now, um, Rancher was developed to address the problem of treating our servers as pets, right? We, as a engineering community, have, have always um, had this tension of wh whether we're managing f uh, groups of servers as pets or if we can treat them um, uh, and, and address them in a more scalable manner, and the analogy is, of course, cattle. Um, right, we can we can address servers as one single unit and, and modify them uh, collectively and have consistency and repeatability. And if we lose lose a server um, that that because you know, it fails, that's fine because we just replace it with a new server, which then assumes that same functionality and role automatically. There's no more like, well, the pet server name, you know, Freddy or you know whatever failed, and I got to rebuild it now. I got to go take care of the sick server and, and rebuild it, and that's a day of my time. We, we want to get away from that. So that's why we, did, we uh, started Rancher. Um, also, we all needed jobs. That was part of it, I suppose, right? But um, uh, more importantly, we wanted to do something meaningful at our career, which was improve technology uh, for the engineering community. So we developed technologies to help solve this problem. We developed Cattle, our first cluster orchestrator for containers. This is when we just had Docker back in the day. And then we developed um, Rancher for Kubernetes when Kubernetes became sort of the de facto standard for container management. We um, built a technology to allow you then to manage Kubernetes more effectively in, in, um, and scale across many environments. Okay, so that, that's what we did five years ago and that's been our evolution. What's happened now is we've sort of gone 360 again, back to the same problem, which is containers are no longer, sorry, Servers are no longer pets. We've solved that problem. They're definitely cattle now with Kubernetes and uh, containers and all the orchestration technologies that we've developed with the CNCF and what really the CNCF has developed at large. That's all solved. Now the Kubernetes cluster itself has become the new pet, right? That's, it's, it's replaced the, the pet that we got rid of uh, and it's just moved up the stack. So. What we, we developed Fleet to address this very problem of the, the cluster of Kubernetes is becoming the new pet and now becoming an administrative overhead, which is slowing us down as engineers from getting to the interesting problems, which are once we get Kubernetes running and we actually start using um, all the CNCF tools to build applications. Like that's where we want to get to, let's be honest. It's not, we don't, we don't get excited about getting Kubernetes working anymore, at least I don't think so. We get excited about using, you know, service mesh and, you know, advanced logging and instrumentation and, um, 
you know, CIC, advanced CICD methodologies and doing blue-green deployments and A-B testing and, you know, doing um, uh, proportional weight routing and circuit breakers between our microservices. That's what we want to get to. It's not, it's not this part. So, um, again, we, we hope that we can help remove some of the, the, the burden and some of the administrative overhead that started to develop at the cluster level. So that's a long-winded way to explain. That's why uh, we think Kubernetes um, needs fleet and needs something because we have more than one cluster. We know uh, we know engineering groups now that are you know in the thousands of clusters already, and they need consistency across them. So how do you manage policy? How do you manage application deployment? How do you manage infrastructure maintenance? Um, if you're using CRDs, for instance, you have to register. You need those CRDs to be consistently deployed across all of your clusters. Let's say you have special ingress settings. So many people now have to have, you know, Nginx tuned a certain way or they want TCP forwarding enabled. So the moment you do that, now you're gonna need special YAMLs that have to be, you know, deployed at the kube system level for the for your ingress. Okay, who's gonna keep track of all those files and make sure they're consistent across your clusters? You know, these are the these are the types of problems you know that needs need addressing. And then when you start to try to push that those settings out, how do you make sure that they're consistently deployed, monitoring the, the deployment of those things, making sure that there's eventual consistency. And that ties into, of course, with eventual consistency, visibility, rule-based access control, and um, you know, a controlled rollout method, because of course, you, when you get to large cluster scale, you don't wanna do these things atomically, you want to do them transitionally or gradually, okay? So why millions? So maybe that's a, a question that doesn't even need to be addressed in some people's minds, because you're already living it. But for those who haven't experienced this yet, um, the trend that, that, that I'd like to tell you about that is happening is as companies are embracing uh, Kubernetes in more uh, in new use cases like near edge and far edge especially, and it's not just these, but these are the ones that really kind of turn the dial up very quickly. Now all of a sudden we have a order of magnitude increase in the number of clusters that are going to be uh, managed by an organization. We know, we know companies that are using Kubernetes, you know, on windmills in, in, in uh, energy farms, you know, and there's just hundreds and hundreds of endpoints and hundreds and hundreds of clusters now because of that. And, um, uh, you know, you've got the telco space, which has got devices in the field everywhere, right? Telcos have cell towers, tens of thousands of them. A lot of them, have you guys ever driven up to a cell tower before and, and like peeked over the, the fence and looked at kind of the the electronics there, I'm not suggesting you, uh, you know, those are normally rest restricted areas, so I'm not suggesting you uh, interfere with anything there. But if you ever just happen to notice them, there's a full, there's usually a full like 42U rack or something, uh, or not, you know, or, or sometimes smaller, uh, but a sizable rack and cabinet there full of servers. So those are data centers, you know, that are out sitting behind your Walmart parking lot in the back. I and mean, that's a data center right there those are going to become Kubernetes clusters. And so now we're talking about tens of thousands of clusters. So existing solutions, they get to about here. And why is that? Well, it's because the existing solutions rely on artisanal craftsmanship to maintain those clusters. They rely on a subject matter expert who is able to you know, put together a Kubernetes cluster over a few days very well from their skills and from the tools they have but they have to do it manually every time. And that just doesn't, you know, that scales to about the, the 10 to 50 cluster range before things start to become, um, have some friction. So that, that's why we're doing this, essentially. Um, so let's talk a little bit about existing GitOps scaling approaches, because this isn't necessarily the only way to approach it. There, there is some, some models where um, people have built things, for instance, that um, try to have uh, something inside the Kubernetes cluster just pull from a Git repo. And so you have a repo per cluster. Um, uh, the, you know, this can work in some cases. There's a, there's a disadvantage of this though, is you have a lot of repos to manage. You have a one-to-one -one relationship now between the repo and the cluster. And so you've almost just offset or transferred your, excuse me, administrative overhead of your clusters to a different system, right? To your Git repos. And now you have to deal with the problem there a little. So that, that's not great. Furthermore, how do you visualize and see who's pulled what? If everything's just pulling asynchronously, 
um, there's uh, as soon as you, you, you commit it, it's just going to start getting consumed and you don't really know how fast and you don't really know, you don't have any control over the rate of that consumption. So that can be kind of a problem. So the, the kind of the reflection of that is people then respond by, okay, let's create one repo to solve that problem. And now I have a single point of control. They don't have the repo sprawl problem. Okay, that's great. It's still a disadvantage though is you don't have a way to control rollout. In fact, in some ways you've created a new problem, which is now you've got an atomic lever is your only way to make changes. All, all I can do is make an, a, an atomic commit and all of a sudden everything gets the change at once. And if you're talking about a global data center, sorry, a global cluster footprint, you know, a thousand clusters in 25 points of presence across the world, you know, which is kind of the, the minimum we're talking about before we get even into the fun stuff, that's not going to work so well. You don't want that to happen all at once because you really want to make sure that you're monitoring the impact and, and, and uh, effect of those changes. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, then, Another way to solve that problem of control is, okay, let's not let it, let it pull. Let's instead just push to it. So then we get a single repo, and then in theory we can control it because we're pushing out the changes um, and controlling sort of when those things are seen across the world. Okay, that's good. Um, um, the challenge there, of course, though, is the push model. It, it just doesn't scale well unless you have good tooling. And um, push also requires this concept of a network ingress and if we're talking about distributed systems globally the moment we start talking about WAN and edge we're talking about links that are untrusted by nature we're talking about going over significant terrestrial distances where we're gonna have links that are not trusted and we and uh, they're not gonna always be on a private backhaul and so the moment that happens we have to be much more defensive about what things we let reach into that environment remotely I don't want something reaching into my windmill uh, generator station from across the world uh, if I can avoid it. And so that's where ingress is a security obstacle, not impossible, but it makes it harder. So that's why we chose an agent model because an agent model allows us to have a agent that makes it, uh, doesn't require ingress because it sits within the downstream cluster, so in the windmill the agent will live there with the cluster and it's periodically checking for new updates that it might want to consume, but it's initiating an outbound request talking to a trusted endpoint. So that's much more secure. I don't have to have my firewall open at all, right? So so that's that's one advantage. But then because it's not just, you know, checking a GitHub repo or a Git repo, it's actually checking an internal engine that's making decisions and telling it if it should have updates. Now we get the control that we want. We get uh, ro role-based access control. We get conditional deployment. So when this node, or sorry, this cluster checks in with the, uh, the master here, this master may say, hey, you have an update. But when this one checks in, it will say, no, you don't have an update yet because it hasn't told, it hasn't decided to update to this one yet. So we get that control. And of course, now we also know, hey, someone checked in. And hey, this thing just reported back that it applied the change successfully. So now I have a transaction. I don't just have, uh, you know, uh, commit and see what happens. And maybe I get a phone call. Now I have a transaction, right? Which has all the benefits of transactions that we all value in our data systems, right? Um, okay, so normally I would stop for questions here, but you know, the way this webinar works is we do questions at the end. So uh, I know this is a lot of information and just take notes if you can, if you have any questions or just try to, maybe you have better memory than I do because I know I would forget if I had to wait. So I apologize, but we're gonna get to questions soon because I know this is a lot of stuff, but um, just just really high level here. Um, this is the, the architecture of fleet. So we got our downstream clusters in a cluster group and they're checking in with the fleet controller cluster which has a definition set or a bundle definition of state that it's trying to propagate based on what's Git, what's in Git. So Git, or, and you know, we've got GitHub here because it's a recognizable logo. It's not just GitHub, it's any Git, but you know, ostensibly now GitHub is just Git, right? They've, they've sort of um, uh, claimed that nomenclature for sure. And um, so, you know, practically speaking, you got your GitHub repo, 
it's the source of truth now. It's got all of the state that you want to see in your clusters. And the controller's job is just to follow the directions of that Git repo and make sure that they follow or are seen uh, outside in the real world. Um, uh, here's the roadmap that we're working on. Our 2.5 release, this is now GA. Um, so you can use this today in Rancher. Now Rancher, by the way, if not mentioned, is an open source project. Rancher itself is not a CNCF uh, incubated technology. Um, we have actually many others that are though. Uh, Longhorn uh, is a technology that we donated to the CNCF. K3S is a technology we donated to the CNCF. So Rancher is an engineering group um, uh, is very uh, involved with, with contributing to the CNCF um, and uh, values that heavily. Uh, Rancher, the, uh, the product Rancher is an open source, 100% open source product. So you can download this today if you ever wanted to try it and it is available now with the 2.5. Um, in future versions, we're gonna add things for private Git repos, you know, some kind of housekeeping things around different use cases like, okay, maybe there's proxies or advanced security settings or credentials that are needed. Um, and then, you know, we're going to, in the future versions, really try to dial up the UX in our UI to make it more comprehensive, although I think you'll see it's pretty good now. Things like automatic deployment rollback, you know, if something fails, we can automatically roll back. Um, and probably much more because we're just starting this journey. And so that's for spring of 2021, that's kind of what you can expect. So, um, okay, we don't need any useful assets. That's been, you've been useful enough PowerPoint. Um, so that's uh, a ton of information. Did I lose everybody? Okay, we still have people, that's good. Um, I have spoken into an empty audience for a long time before, so it wouldn't be the first. Um, okay, so what time is it? 11.20, okay, I think we can do this. So now we're gonna do a live demo. Who likes live demos? Silence is encouraging. Okay, good. Um, so let's take a look at our Rancher UI here. Oh, why is it refreshing? What did I, what did I touch? Hmm. Okay, that's not good timing. One sec. We should know that this would happen in a demo, right? back so imagine this world now we're in we're in a rancher server we have two clusters that are downstream cluster one and cluster two and I have a git repo on github and this git repo has some examples for fleet there's a bunch of different examples here we're gonna do something really simple today because that's that's the best way to start one of these demos live um, I don't know if I've had enough coffee to do anything more, more crazy. Um, so this here is a red set of Redis uh, containers. And you can see here, these are actually just YAML files. And has anyone seen one of these before? I hope so, right? If you guys use Kubernetes, you've probably seen one of these. Um, so one of the first things you'll notice here is, hey, there's no special syntax. We're not introducing a new language or, you know, oh, no, there's a new fleet you know, configuration language and syntax you have to follow and it's going to be, you know, and it's a variant of TCL or something or, yeah, I hope you like semicolons or something like that. None, none of that. It's just YAML, just normal YAML. You can just drop it into a repo. Now, that being said, there are some key situations we discovered where you might want some more metadata. So there is a option to do, is it here? The bundle, where's our bundles? Here's our fleet YAML. There is an option to basically have this metadata file and then do some more like metadata e things like target customizations and, and specify all this stuff in the repo. So um, that's an option too. So there, it's more than just pure YAML, but it is pure YAML if you want it. And then finally, you can actually have just Helm charts in here. So this is not a replacement for Helm. This is not. This is, this is not trying to do anything Helm does. This just tries to take Helm 
as, uh, and use it for a greater purpose, uh, along with the other things we're trying to accomplish, right? Okay, so this is our, our repo here. So let's say we wanted to use this to control this. What, do we, what would we do? I wonder if I know, I hope I know. We'll find out. Okay, I'm gonna copy this Git repo here. And I'm gonna first go to the cluster explorer because this actually all happens within our new UI called View, which is also known as the cluster explorer. So you wanna go in here right away. And this is probably where you wanna stay ultimately as you start getting used to Rancher 2.5. So now I wanna create a Git repo in Fleet. So notice I went to continuous delivery. This is the new feature here, right? And now I'm gonna put in a unique name. What should we call this? CNCF rocks, how's that? No objections, good. Um, because we all love the CNCF. All right, and the repository is that, which is not that, it has to be HTTP probably. Actually, I might use Git protocol, but why, why find out right now? Uh, I could choose a branch if I wanted, a revision, you know, uh, this is Git based. So you can expect to get like features. Um, I am gonna use the path simple because I wanna just use this one simple set of configs. I don't wanna do the whole thing. Okay, uh, and then where do I deploy to? So here's where some of the fun stuff gets. I can deploy to all the clusters, I can deploy specific clusters, or I can deploy to a cluster group. I wanna do a cluster group because that gives me the most control. So I'm gonna create this, and now, I'm use, now it's pointing to a cluster group. Now a cluster group is just basically a, uh, a pointer or a way to address multiple sets of clusters based on labels. So it's just kind of the classic label selector idea, um, which allows me then to add and remove things without kind of messing with the actual repo parent setting. So this cluster group here is defined by, did I already actually have these labeled? Nice. Yeah. Ah, yes, okay, they're already labeled. So this cluster group here is defined by cluster location equals North America. It's, a, it's just a label selector. I could put any arbitrary, um, you know, uh, is open source equals yes, right? Anything I want here or is not what happened. In this case, we did cluster location equals North America. My two clusters here, I have also, can you guess what I labeled them? I wish I had giveaways or something, give you a shirt if you got the answer. Cluster location equals North America, right? So therefore, this cluster group has a quantity of two clusters. So that's that's how that works. But I could add and remove a cluster very easily just by adding labels. Okay, so since that's happened, it actually is telling me now what just has gone on. So when I applied that, it actually started deploying to those clusters in the meantime, and then it just completed. So it says two clusters, right? Let's go ahead and take a look at a cluster now and see if it's there. There we go, so wait, where are we now? Cluster two, okay, cluster two has front end, Redis master, Redis slave, which is, let's see if that's kind of what we expected. Front end deployment, it's called front end, yep. It's a Redis thing, great. There's a service, the service wouldn't show up there, but that, that'd be kind of the routing behind the scenes. There's another deployment, yeah, Redis slave, replicas two, do I see two there? Redis slave, let's take a look. Replicas two. Okay, cool. So we just basically configured these clusters. Now, I know what you're asking is, hey, you never showed me the clusters before this, so how do I know you just didn't put all that stuff there and just, you know, are pulling my leg? Okay, fair enough. Let's let's um, let's keep me honest here and let's let's remove one of the clusters from the label. Let's just remove the label. Let's go back to the Cluster Explorer. We should see this stuff go away. Give me a second here, once it synchronizes. Is it not doing that yet? Did it not 
not save my change in C. That is odd. Why is it not? Force update and see if that does it. still thinks it's got two clusters when it doesn't. Well, let's just let's just do it this way then. I'm going to delete those objects and they won't get recreated hopefully. Because it's it really should be ignoring that cluster at this point. Yeah, it's, it doesn't even talk about that cluster anymore, so it's ignoring it, but it didn't uh, clean it up. That might be a minor bug that we have to look into. Um, okay, so repo's ready zero. Okay, that's what we want to see now. So, um, yeah, there's nothing there. Okay, cool. So let me just add that cluster back in, though. And then now just again prove. Edit is form cluster location North America so let's see if these things pop up now oh there you go it's updated now. okay so that's good all right so let's try another thing let's let's do another kind of common workflow which is okay cool so I got my my, my clusters are connected here to Git. now I should be able to just control things through Git, right so who wants to add another redis uh, node to our to our our cluster here. I can just feel the excitement. You all do. I get it. I know. I know the feeling. You just Redis needs more more nodes. Let's let's make that happen. All right. So Redis has two replicas now. What do you say we go to three? All right. So let's just again try to make sure that there's no man behind the curtain here, so we can all see what's happening. Redis replicas two. Redis replicas three. The Redis slave. Let's commit directly to the master branch, like all good DevOps engineers do. All right? No, this is not CNCF recommended. I'm I'm being told right now by the moderators that I need to retract that statement. CNCF does not recommend committing to the master directly. So, you, know, you always want to always want a pull request. All right, so I'm going to commit to master directly, <clears throat> which again is not great, but for the purposes of this. And in time, it's gonna check and say, oh look, hey, look, something changed. I need to go change the world around me. And look at that, replicas three. And now there is three. So there you have it. That is, um, that is now working. So what, what you see here is like, I just committed a change here to Git and it just changed it in two of my clusters. If I had two or 2,000, it would be the same. Oh, by the way, do you want to look at the other cluster just to see what, if, what cluster one is looking like? What do you think is going to be there? OK, same things, right? How many should be here? Three. Perfect, right? So now we just have this identical state across all of our clusters. Now, admittedly, I'm really focusing on the example of Redis, an application. So you might be saying, OK, I could always, I, I've been able to use Helm and just you know, Helm, Helm update across five clusters, no problem, not a big deal. I can just have a script to sort of synchronize all my deployments with Helm, not a big deal. Yeah, that, that's fair. Um, that's, that's not the only use case, again, that you're gonna wanna think about, though. It's The problem is, what if Redis needed CRDs or modifications to the Kube system or storage classes provisioned, right? Or system level things in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is now a complex piece of machinery those things can't be necessarily captured in a Helm chart easily. Um, that's where this, this is coming in because now we're doing that in Git as well. So now the Git repo is cohesive. It's the whole thing. 
This goes right back to the Docker thing. Why was Docker so, so powerful initially? Well, one of the reasons was is because it just worked. On, if it worked on your box, it worked on any box because there was none of this uh, dependency injection that we've lived by for the last 20 years in engineering where it's like, okay, yeah, everything will work except you need like, do you have the right version of you know, libc and libxml on your box? Oh yeah, if you don't have the right version, it will, it will fail. And it's like, well, okay, but not everybody's gonna have the same version, so that's, a, that's not a complete solution. And Docker solved that by saying, everything's gonna work, everything's gonna be in the image. And it's a, it's a, it's a comprehensive solution. It, you know, it doesn't leave anything uh, up for, for surprise. And that's the same thing here. Now the entire cluster can be described. And notice I said can be, you don't have to. You're not confined to doing everything to get. I can still edit these clusters. No problem. That's that all my other tools are going to work. Nothing is, nothing's impacting my existing tool set. But I can, if I want to, and if I have that pattern, describe everything through code. So this is infrastructure as code now for Kubernetes. Um, so with that, um, rather than doing any more demos, I see some questions coming in, and I'd really like to get to the questions. If it's all right with everyone else, could we start answering some of these? Sounds good, William. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. And, and everyone, this is uh, Connie Lynn, our events manager at Rancher. And so thank you for helping us today with, um, with questions. Hello. Yeah, thank, uh, happy to be on here. Um, so yeah, we do have quite a bit of questions coming in. I'm going to kind of go down this list here. Uh, you know, there's some questions that came in earlier during your presentation, William. So. Zolt here asked, um, which also is related to another question, how are secrets managed, especially ones that have to differ between clusters? Hmm. Yes, yes, that's a very good question. Um, I'm, actually, I'm actually thinking about our new backup operator, because our backup operator, we actually have a decryption engine for when we pull the secret out of state and we store it in the backup object. I think that's, I think that's the same thing we do here because we actually are basically capturing every Kubernetes resource with our backup operator for preservation. So I think you can use that same encryption format, um, but I need, I need to double check on that. Um, that's a very good question. Now, as far as secrets differing, um, you can still mutate things outside of fleet. Right, so anything, only fleet is only caring about the things it knows about. That, that's part of the beauty of this. Again, it's not a, um, it's not an abstraction. It's not an abstraction, there's no opacity on your cluster at all. So what I would do in that situation right away is, okay, secrets are different, I'm gonna deploy secrets through some Jenkins job or some other you know, very secure controlled deployment tool that is just for that purpose. Because that's, you know, that's a small amount of entropy that I can deal with, so that's how I would do that. Great. Thanks, William. Uh, next question is from Patrick. Patrick asks, can the continuous delivery configuration in Rancher also be done using code with Terraform? Or Terraform, for instance. Yeah. So using Terraform to I mean, Terra, I'm just trying to think of how, how Terraform could be applied here, because Terraform is, is largely concerned with the infrastructure um, below. And so by the time we get to fleet, we've already got Kubernetes clusters running. Now, Terraform could be producing the clusters that then get registered into the fleet agent, into the fleet system. So the registration of a working cluster, again, is kind of here, right? This is where I sort of assign clusters to now be registered to be assimilated by the Borg, if you will, if you guys are any Star Trek fans, right? The Borg would come and assimilate you and now you're part of the collective. And that's actually not a far-fetched analogy because what I've read is the original Google technology was actually called Seven of Nine and then later Borg, you know, so either of them are, um, either of them are uh, quite, you know, Star Trek, Star Trek leaning. So yes, the same, you can just really think of like, something has to create the, the thing that is gonna be assimilated by the Borg, if you will. Um, and that could be Terraform, but uh, Terraform doesn't have really a place once we've got the cluster running, because now we're controlling everything through Kubernetes. So I hope that answers the question. 
Sounds good. Thanks. So a couple additional questions coming in here. Let's see. Can we create clusters on GKE, AKS, or EKS from Rancher, or should we register them after creation? That's a great question. Yeah, um, you, you can do that. Um, basically, you can do both. So you're kind of asking a, an opinion question, which I think I would want to know a little more about your use case. But um, if I look at the add cluster page here in Rancher, um, it's probably easiest in those cases to just do it right from Rancher. Um, so I could go down here and just click EKS and choose the region, put your Amazon keys in, and have to fill out some more forms. And it will basically talk to Amazon and say, build a cluster and register it. Um, we are finding too that there's a lot of people who want to use something. Okay, so it ties into the previous question, Terraform. They want to use Terraform because they like what that provides to build their infrastructure. So in that case, use Terraform to build EKS, and then you can register it or import it into Rancher and continue on the journey with Rancher to manage it. So both are available. The easiest is just to use Rancher just to provision into EKS, AKS, or GKE, um, one click. So. Great. All right, we have a few additional questions here. Um, one attendee is asking, will Fleet obey HPA or scale down to manifest original replicas value? That's a very insightful and sort of like advanced question. That's, that'd be like the advanced question on the test, wouldn't it? To, to know that. <laughs> um, I like this, I'm glad they're keeping me on my toes. I would think that it would, um, it would see the transaction completion as, um, uh, so, so, so the transactions that are, are driven are driven by Git um, changes. So, in theory, if it made the transaction complete and the HPA is deployed, it's not going to necessarily be like seeing, oh, did the deployment number change from what was in Git? It's not doing that because it's not trying to control those things. It's only going to be pushing down changes that Git is signaling. So now, if Git, excuse me, if the HPA does its thing and mutates the scale of that deployment and then later you make a change in Git, it's going to get reset back to that original number if you've defined that as a, as a um, replica quantity. There might be a way in the HPA YAML to make sure that it doesn't do that. Um, I'd have to look into that, but essentially it's, it's possible that we'd have to figure out exactly the best way to do it. So let's um, Definitely feel free to follow up with me, William at Rancher, um, if you want to uh, discuss that further or just um, jump in one of our user slacks and ask someone. Great, thank you, William. Um, another question here. In case of build service, upload Helm chart uh, to the Helm repo and push image to the registry to use Rancher UI API to deploy the chart um, kind of that workflow. What is the recommended way to use Fleet? Yeah, so if you're using Fleet, you aren't necessarily going to use the catalog in the same way. There is a bit of overlap there. So like adding a Helm chart to a, to a repository and then going to our sort of our classic app catalog. Oops, I'm not in the right spot, am I? because these, all these windows are in front now. So our classic app catalog here where you can deploy apps, you know, this is based on a, on a repositories you build. You probably don't want to use both of these in the same way. Um, or, you, I mean, you could. So you could if you basically, hey, I just want Grafana for this one cluster, that's fine. But um, if, if I'm doing this across a lot of clusters and I want consistency, I wouldn't do it through here. I would take this code and put it into a fleet repo and then control it that way. So um, there are tools that can both do similar jobs, but one of them is better at a certain scale, if that makes sense. Great, thanks for answering that. Um, the next question 
from Patrick asks, how is the replica change in Redis from two to three different using fleet than using uh, Argo, Argo CD, for instance? Yeah, I don't know of any difference with Argo CD, and I don't know Argo well enough probably to, to make any comments on it. Um, there, there is some difference in approach, I know, from, from how our engineering team um, uh, developed fleet. Um, I think Argo definitely does more of, is more of a top-down push model, less of an agent and check-in model. Um, but in terms of that one nuance, I, I, don't, I don't know of any difference off the top of my head. Great. So our next, uh, there's two questions here related to Git repos. Um, Nico asks, can the Git repos be deployed in new Rancher project as well? And a second question uh, asks, how can accidental or forgotten manual changes be removed to synchronize what's deployed with what's in the Git repo? Okay, I'll answer the last one first because that one I can show quickly. So if I can just do a force update, and that should override that should override anything that was different now or out of sync. Um, so if I did make manual changes, I could kind of force change them that way. The first question, um, I'm not sure I understand. Um, could, could you say it one more time? Yeah. Uh, so it asks. Nico asks, can the Git repos be deployed in a new Rancher project as well? Uh, so maybe, maybe the, so can like the, the code, the applications and deployments represented here, can they be deployed in a different project, I think maybe? And um, yeah, so right now these were, um, how did we define that? Right now, these were deployed to default. Um, we could we could define that I think through the fleet bundle in Git. We didn't. There's none of that here in this example. But I think we can also do that from the the definition here. Let's see. I think we can say the name target namespace. Yep, there it is. There. So we can say um, you know the namespace we want to deploy it into, and the namespace is just a member of a project. In, in Rancher. Ran project is just sort of a container around namespaces. Okay. Great. So it looks like we have um, seen two questions left here. Uh, the next one is, I think, more of a general Rancher question. So does Rancher allow us to upgrade all nodes, uh, Kubernetes versions for a cluster group? whether it is managed clusters or K3S. So upgrading the Kubernetes pieces on them, managed clusters or K3S. So if the moment we're talking about managed clusters, like the moment we're talking about different Kubernetes infrastructure management, then, then um, it's not gonna be the same across, right? So like if it's K3S, there's an upgrade path for, for upgrading all those nodes. If it's managed by, if it's Kubernetes managed by Google, by GKE, they, they have their own way of, they control that. We, we, don't, we don't get to control that. We can make an API call, maybe asking them to in some cases, but we don't get to control how the update process works. So it is different than for different cluster types. Um, you know, what, I think what you're, you're envisioning is a world where I kind of have one way of managing the Kubernetes distribution on every node across my infrastructure types. If, if that's what you want, then you want to look at something like K3S or RKE2, and then you're using that same technology to build even in the cloud. So like then I wouldn't use EKS, I would use RKE on EC2, just nodes, because then I control what the upgrade path is like and I can have it consistent for EC2 and for my on-prem and for my edge. So you'd have to use the same technology across. And that's what Rancher provides, but we we also recognize that a lot of people want to use, there's so much in the cloud that they might as well just use EKS because they have so much in the cloud. So we, we support both of them. They're both first class citizens for us. But if your goal is consistency across infrastructures, then you need to choose a rancher technology as your distribution. Thanks. Uh, 
Thanks, William. All right, so um, looks like you're getting close on time. Uh, one last question here. Uh, I do see additional questions coming in, but um, hopefully we'll be able to follow up with attendees here uh, and get your individual questions answered that we weren't get able to get to today. Um, so last question here, William, what is the easiest way to try out Fleet? That's a good question. Um, well, and important because I hope you guys can all try this ultimately. That's the best way to learn and see if it's right for you. Um, easiest way is to set up a rancher server and um, then add more, add one cluster to it. If I had to do this with like two nodes, let's just say, let's say I want to go to DigitalOcean or you know, light sail or EC2 and just create two nodes. Here's what I would do. I would, um, uh, I would actually check out Rancher D. And this is actually not considered production uh, ready yet. This is actually brand new. So don't you know, use this for evaluation purposes, but this is really fast to get started. I would check out, sorry, you know, move that window. I can't move my windows at all. All the Zoom windows are on top now of. All right. Uh, so I check out Rancher D and just Google Rancher D and this blog will tell you about it. And literally to, to run the installer is this one command on a single node and that will install your Rancher server. It will look just like this. And that's actually what I'm, I'm running here on a on a VM at my house. Um, yes, I'm at home. Uh, don't tell my boss I'm not, I didn't come into the office today. Um, just kidding, I think we all know we're all, everyone, most of us are working from home these days. So yeah, this is my home network. This is a home uh, VM, single node, running Rancher with Rancher D. And then um, once I install Rancher D, then I need one additional node to be my downstream cluster. And what I would do for that is K3S because it's really uh, resource efficient. So I can run a whole cluster again on one node very efficiently. And guess what? That's also one command. So I would run that command, and then I would go into my Rancher cluster that I have running, say add cluster, and it'd be another cluster, foo bar, and I would run, I would copy this command onto the, another, the other VM that I just ran K3S on so that it gets registered into the cluster. And at that point now I have Rancher server and one downstream cluster, and that's all I need to try out Fleet and a Git repo. And just go ahead and fork, uh, fork the examples from Rancher slash Fleet examples just to try it out. You don't even need to like write your own YAML. Just fork this one on our GitHub. So that's that's what I would do. Thanks, William. I uh, hope everybody can give that a shot. And uh, William, if you do, you have any more comments, or are we? Pretty much wrapped up. Here I think with I've you. done enough talking, haven't I? I'm sure you guys are tired of it. Um, but thanks for everyone for participating, and I hope, hope we can hope we can help you guys with more things in the future. All right. Thank you so much, William. That was great. Thanks, Connie. And hope everyone has a great day. Bye bye.